versus P9 Tennessee investment for separatory. Same rules, 15 minutes. You may reserve up to five if you so choose to be a fellow. Uh, I'd like to reserve five for both. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. This is a companion case to the case that we just argued. Uh, it was filed uh, first. Um, the case actually attacked the, um, the uh, Cognola promissory notes and asked the judge the trial judge to issue a temporary restraining order and prevent uh, Praetorium from exercising the cognitive provisions of the note. Um, the the um, issue in this case involves, well, this case is bounced around from uh, Lane County to the Northern District of Ohio to the uh, District of Nevada, uh, back to Lorain County, and now the, the order that is subject of this appeal is Judge Moraldi's order that the case be transferred to a state court in Reno, you know, Nevada. Um, we respectfully ask that the Judge uh, Moraldi's uh, decision be reversed. He view the form selection clause, and there is a form selection clause in the documents. Um, in Judge Moraldi's view, he's thought that the form selection clause was mandatory, and we believe that he is incorrect in that regard. We think it's permissive. Now, if the form selection clause is permissive, then uh, the plaintiff is free to file wherever the plaintiff wants to. He can be guided by the form selection clause or not. Um, we filed in Lorain County. Lorain County was a, an appropriate forum. There are two cases decided by this court that we urge the court to review um, to make a determination as to whether or not the, the the uh, clause is permissive. Most cases are um, EI, EIUK Holdings and Renacci. Now, under those, each of those cases, in order to be a mandatory form selection clause, the clause has to contain a reference to venue. It also has, the clause also has to say that venue is exclusive in the foreign court. And the form selection clause also has to say that suits elsewhere than the named court are prohibited. Our form selection clause does not say that, and therefore it is not mandatory, and it can be uh, the, the plaintiffs can file in Lorain County if they so choose, and they did, and they, they did choose to do so. Um, if the clause is found to be mandatory, then we urge the court to find that the uh, clause itself is unreasonable and unjust because it requires non-contracting parties to file their suit or to litigate in a, in a foreign jurisdiction when they've already chosen to, to uh, file in the Wayne County. If this court should affirm the judgment of the of Judge Bitleski in the other case and find that the motion to and find that the motion to vacate was properly granted, then we fully intend to file um, the remainder of the action that would be transferred um, in Lorain County. So we would have two cases pending against the same defendants in two different jurisdictions, two different states. And in our view, that is uh, that 
makes the uh, makes the case uh, makes the forum selection clause if it is mandatory it makes it unreasonable and unjust. Thank you very much. selection clause that's included in the subject documents mandate that this case be initiated in state court in Reno, Nevada? And the answer is, of course it does. Judge Nugent, United States District Court, Northern District of Ohio, Judge John Raldi in the Moray County Court of Common Pleas, both already reviewed this issue in detail. It was fully briefed in both courts with the exact same arguments, same law, same facts, both concluded that it was a mandatory enforceable foreign selection clause. This court should reach the same decision. The plaintiff's appellants brought suit against the defendant's appellees, alleging breaches of contract and related claims, economic duress, once again, that rears its head, fraud, equitable subordination, related to two separate loan committees. There's a $24 million senior loan and a $3.5 million construction loan. Now, both of those loan documents in which is the genesis of their claims, have the exact same clear, unambiguous, mandatory form selection clause. And this is it in its entirety. It is titled Exclusive Jurisdiction. That's the title. The words are, the parties acknowledge and consent to the exclusive jurisdiction of any competent court in Reno, Nevada. The word exclusive is used twice, in the title and in the text. The party challenging it foreign selection clause bears a heavy burden of establishing that it should not be enforced. Now again, it's been decided twice. Judge Nugent reviewed, analyzed the same case, same facts, same law, same arguments. He transferred the case to district court in Nevada. And there was an issue with respect to diversity, which is why it wasn't a competent court of jurisdiction in Reno in federal court because of lack of diversity. Then the case was transferred back from federal court in Reno to Lorain County Common Pleas. The issue was raised again. Same facts, same arguments, same law. Judge John Moraldi concluded it's a mandatory enforceable foreign selection clause. I'm going to stay the case, refile it in Reno State Court, and then this case will be dismissed. Nothing's changed. Everything's the same. There's no reason for an, another court to not look at the other previous two decisions and reach the same conclusion. Now, the appellants talk about the mandatory versus permissive, and they rely on two cases, the EIUK Holdings case and the Renaki case, which were both decided by this court. There's also another case, the Preferred Capital case, is what they cite. These three cases are what they say why this particular case and this form of selection clause is not mandatory. In ours, we have exclusive jurisdiction in the title and the word exclusive, the words exclusive jurisdiction in the text. In EIUK Holdings, the actual provision at issue said, quote, non-exclusive jurisdiction. That means permissive. It's allowing the parties to say, you may file it here, regardless of whether or not this is a proper form by personal jurisdiction, or you may file it somewhere else, because it says non-exclusive in the EIUK case. In the Renaki case, it just says they consent to jurisdiction. It did not contain the words exclusive. Once again, that's different than what we have here. We have exclusive in this case. The preferred capital case had what they call a floating form selection clause. You must bring it into, into a jurisdiction in which one of the parties has their headquarters, which may potentially move. And the court concluded that's not going to be enforceable. So those are the types of cases that are permissive, not the clear language of what exclusive means. Exclusive means exclusive. That's the only place you can bring it. The enforceability issue. 
there are a few ways that you have to satisfy the test. The only one that's been complained about is whether it's unjust or unreasonable to be able to enforce it against a non signatory Well, that is outlined in the brief. The case law is clear. A non-signatory to a form selection clause may be bound by that clause if the non-signatory is closely related to the contracting party. And it's foreseeable that they would be bound by it. Here we have all of the parties, and there are eight plaintiffs' appellants in this case. They all brought suit, all arising under the construction loan, loan commitment, and the senior loan commitment. They're all closely related. All of them have filed suit seeking the same damages under these commitments. All but one use the exact same address in the complaint. The previous two courts looked at this issue and both affirmatively stated that they are interrelated parties. They are closely related. The courts take a common sense, totality of the circumstances approach in determining whether or not they're closely related. Both courts, United States District Court, Northern District, Lorain County Common Police Court, both of those courts looked at these issues. Both of them looked, totality of the circumstances, concluded that these non-signatories are closely related and therefore are bound by this clause. Now, there has been repeated statements that this is a companion case, or that somehow this case is related to the other case. Admittedly, there are some of the same parties in the two cases, the one we've argued a little bit earlier today, and then in this case. But not all the parties are the same. There are different parties involved. The case we talked about a little bit ago dealt with one particular note, an actual cognovit note, for $2.995 million. This case here deals with two construction loan commitments that were not finalized. Therefore, there's an alleged over breach of contract and an economic duress that relate to two separate notes or two separate loans. Those aren't related cases. What should happen is, is that in the previous case that we talked about, the judgment should be enforced so we can go after and collect on the money that's owed to us. And then, to the extent that this case proceeds, wherever it is, happen to be here or in Reno, they're separate issues. They're separate claims. They're separate parties. So they're not companion cases. It is clear that this is an exclusive form selection clause. It's enforceable against all the appellants. It's not a companion case. It's two separate cases. It not, should not be bunched together. The facts, the laws, the arguments, everything's the same that what has already been decided by Judge Nugent and Judge John Morales. This court should affirm those two court's decisions. Judge, Judge Morales ordered sending it to Reno. Was that after? That state court. Was that after his grant of the motion to make it? No, Judge Morales, John Morales, I'd have to take a look. I don't believe he was the same judge that did the. No. Yeah, he was, it was a different judge. It was a different judge. Yeah, I didn't think it was the same judge. Judge March of 2015, I think, when he did the motion to vacate. That is correct. That is correct. This one, and then when in relation to that was this transfer to that? This was, if, if, excuse me, Your Honor, I can take a look here. At the exact date of when this was transferred, sorry. It was signed by Judge Moraldi on June 16th of 2015. So he had already vacated the cognitive. That is correct. Judgment at the time he transferred this to the Nevada State Court. Right, but again, these are two separate issues. And the transfer, it's more of, it's under Rule 3D. And the case law is clear on what the procedure is. You stay in this case, have the new case reinstituted in the State Court in Nevada, and then this case would be dismissed. And I just want to get it all straight. The form selection clause, the birth of that is the loan commitment agreement. That's correct. It is not. And by development finance. Yes, development finance is a party here, not a party in the other case. But they were the loan commitment agreement. 
So they were parties to that. That is correct. Was they Praetorium were. part of that? Praetorium was was the commitment agreement where this form selection clause is. There is an allegation by the plaintiffs that Praetorium is related to Guardian and Development Finance and George Crescent. That they're all kind of the same group of individuals, which is why Praetorium is listed as a party. In, in, this in this particular case, the other one is is the loan. Now, in that case, the Cognova. Obviously, there's not going to be an exclusive jurisdiction because that would be a violation of Ohio statutory law. There's only two places you can get a cognome. It's either where the signatory signed the document or the principal residence of the defendant. So that you can't transfer that jurisdiction anywhere else. It's only those two by statute. So that loan is completely separate. That has to be here. Thank you. also in this case, the case that I've been referring to as a companion case. Uh, I indicated earlier that uh, we got a temporary restraining order from Judge Moraldi precluding the cognitive divisions from being enforced. Um, the second thing is that uh, the wording of the clause, uh, there is no explanation as to the wording of the clause actually underscores the reason why in order to have a mandatory form selection clause you should use the word venue and also have a prohibition. You can't tell from looking at the wording of the clause whether jurisdiction refers to personal jurisdiction or subject matter jurisdiction. Um, one could argue that well, the parties intended, uh, intended it to be personal jurisdiction. You could also argue it, could, it was parties intended it to be subject matter jurisdiction because they wanted to confer jurisdiction on the Nevada court. Um, fact of the matter is, you can't tell from looking at the clause. Um, and that is the reason why I think this court has held in previous cases that you have to have certain language in order to have a mandatory form selection clause. As to the, as to the joining of non-parties, um, it is true that uh, Praetorium cites a case called Veteran Payment Systems versus Gossage in its brief for the proposition that non-parties may be bound if they're closely related. However, uh, I encourage the court to review that case carefully because it held that the non-party employer was not bound by the form selection. Klein said that uh, this is the only court in the country where the cognitive provisions could be um, could be utilized. Praetorium could have used the, uh, the promissory note without cognitive provisions and filed in Nevada, but we think that it has been waived by by Praetorium by filing. I mean, the aspect of using the form selection clause has been waived by a Praetorium by filing the cognovid aspect here. It's not Praetorium, it's one to use the form selection clause, isn't it? They have joined in the motion. Okay, good. I mean, it's, the clause is no the finances clause. The clause is in the loan commitments, that's right. How, how could Praetorium waive development finances clause? They're, they're interrelated, development finance and and Praetorium. We allege that in our complaint. We think it's all part of the same ball. Um, and intend to prove that when we uh, have the opportunity to find a really good matter. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. The court um, will take the matter under advisement. I appreciate uh, counsel's arguments here today. And we will send you a written opinion as well as release it on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor.